वसुदेवासुत देव कंसचाणोरमतन देवकी परमानंदम कृष्णम वंदे जगदु ऑल राइट वी आर स्टडीइंग द 7th चैप्टर ऑफ द भगवत गीता एंड वी वर ऑन वर्स नंबर द वेरी ब्यूटीफुल वर्स 16th वर्स व्हिच वी हैड डन आई थिंक टुडे वी हैव टू डू द 17th वर्स राइट the 16th and we'll do the 17th right yes. 16th verse if you remember who worships god chaturvidha bhajante maam jana sukriti no arjuna arto jigyasu arthati gyani cha bharatarshaba sukriti those who have got lot of good karma it so that means it's as a result of past good karma that one has devotion to god but who are these people for what reason do they worship god why do they have devotion to god uh, some want uh, relief from distress artha some come to uh, god because they want something more in the world and uh, then some come for spiritual knowledge jigyasu then those who are already enlightened and perfected they have the highest devotion to god so there are those who are devoted to god for worldly things nothing wrong in it but they want they are suffering in samsara they want uh, relief from the suffering or they are not suffering but they want something more in samsara you see in fact a great deal of the pujas which go on in temples or i've seen prayers in christian churches it is all for uh, something more in life it may not be anything particular but we generally pray that things may go well in my job in my health in my family nothing wrong in that but still it's a prayer for something in this world higher than that is the prayer for spiritual knowledge jigyasu which is what we all are to some degree or the other we are all here because we are inquirers we are spiritual seekers we are sadhakas um you know one sadhu pointed out what is a sadhaka sadhaka literally translates into a practitioner sadhana means spiritual practice sadhaka means who does sadhana the one who does sadhana, sadhana is spiritual one who does spiritual practice is a spiritual practitioner why because there is something called sadhya thing to be attained goal to be attained we clearly have a goal to be attained it's not that we are just doing it casually because we have nothing better to do no we feel that the highest goal in life has to be attained we are really convinced that god realization is possible enlightenment is possible therefore we are doing sadhana so sadhaka spiritual practitioner sadhana spiritual practice sadhya goal of spiritual practice the goal of uh, the attainment god realization now who is a sadhaka uh, how is that person distinguished from other um, the, um, bhaktas so the sadhaka is the one who whose goal is god realization not some worldly goal the goal is not the world the goal is god but that's not enough it's not enough to say my goal is god realization one must systematically practice a path of sadhana meditation japa karma yoga vedanta vichara systematically not casually that sadhu said mahina do mahina mahina mein ek bar mandir to sab log chale jate hain to usse sadhak koi nahi banta so once in a month or once in two months some everybody visits a temple that does not make you a sadhaka a sadhaka or a sadhika is the one who regularly practices spiritual practices and the goal is whether you say it to anybody else or not internally you know god is my goal enlightenment is my goal and so we are like that here so um the jigyasu is a sadhaka the one who is inquiring and then those who have attained the goal they don't want anything more they don't want anything in the world they don't even want uh, god realization because they have already attained they can sing like shankara acharya na dharmo nchartho na kamo na moksha chidananda roopa shivoham shivoham i am not pursuing wealth i am not pursuing worldly pleasure i am not even pursuing heaven after death i am not even pursuing moksha because already i realize my real nature is moksha that is the perfected one so that perfected one need not worship god because the worship is god for two two reasons one is worldly reason relief from distress or attainment of something unattained 
Second one is spiritual reason. I will get the vision of God or I will become a Brahma Jnani. For that reason, I am praying to God. But both are already not, the, the enlightened one does not uh, want. The, the enlightened one does not want both. Then why should the enlightened one worship God? But here Krishna says the enlightened one, the Jnani, is the real devotee. For, for the Jnani, God is actually become real and um, one with God. So the enlightened one's Jnani's bhakti for God is the true unselfish bhakti. It, it, has, it is love for the sake of love. It does not want anything from God. Just God is lovable, so the Jnani loves God. That is the real bhakti, the uh, highest bhakti, where the bhakta does not want anything, not even moksha from God. So these are the four categories. Of course, if you remember last time I gave you a more esoteric, a more uh, inner meaning of that from the perspective of the gopis, the four uh, stages, artha, uh, which means distress in the, in the absence of God. Then jigyasu, the gopis are seeking Krishna everywhere in Vrindavan. Then artharthi, they settle down. They are meditating on Krishna. Krishna becomes all, uh, they, they are completely focused on Krishna. Then jnani would be, they actually attain Krishna. They find Krishna. Uh, and then they are full of joy. So that is also another way of uh, interpreting, but a more deeper way of interpreting. Now, next verse, 17. Tesham jnani nitya yukta eka bhaktir vishishyate priyohi jnani notyartham aham sacha mama priya Of these, the man of knowledge who is constantly in communion and single-minded in devotion excels. To the man of knowledge, I am very dear indeed, and he is dear to me. So, among these four, which four? Artha, Jigyasu, Artharthi, Jnani. Among these four, who is the best? The best, remember best what? The best Bhakta, most devoted. And Krishna says, how paradoxical. We think that these two are separate. Devotee and Jnani. Bhakta and Jnani are separate. The one in the path of knowledge, the one in the path of devotion, they seem to be separate. Krishna is saying the best devotee is the man of knowledge. Why? Why is that person the best devotee? So he says Nitya Yukta first. Nitya Yukta means constantly aware of me, constantly connected to me, constantly in communion with me, with God. Others may have little variation in their communion with God. Um, sometimes bhakti is more, sometimes bhakti is less, devotion is there. Sometimes there is emotion, sometimes there is not. Uh, sometimes it may seem dry and mechanical. Sometimes even, even for um, sadhakas and sadhikas, sometimes they may even doubt. Does God exist? What am I doing? Is it some kind of make-believe? So bhakti for others, before enlightenment, before God-realization, bhakti for others goes up and down. It flickers. Sometimes it can be more, it can be less. A person may be connected with God or may move away for a time being. If he's a person is a real bhakta, will not permanently move away. But for a time being, may actually. Um, it may become, fade to the background, it may become mechanical. But not so for the jnani. For the jnani, it is always fresh, always intense and um, always fresh and intense and uh, always real uh, and effortless. For others, they have to do practices. For the jnani, the bhakti is effortless. Why so? This is nitya yukta, ever connected. How is the jnani ever connected? You have to understand this way. From Advaitic perspective, it can be easily understood. Um, our own inner self, I, this awareness, I'm a sentient being, all of us, um, our own existence is always clear to us. Not that we are always thinking about it, not that I'm always thinking I am, I am, I'm not thinking that. But if I ever want, it's present. It is more powerful than memory. We cannot depend on memory because sometimes memory, we have a you know, like tip of the tongue. I know what it is, but I can't tell you just now. It's Or forgotten. Or I know I remember it, but I can't recall it now. So memory is, is, um, is even though it is all within us, it's still not reliable. 
understanding, intellect, buddhi, still not reliable. I may understand something. I got it. After a few months, as I had got it at that time. Now I've forgotten it. But now I don't understand. I've become confused again. Emotions are not reliable. Same thing you may love, same thing next moment you may hate. Or the love may go down. Intellect is not dependable. Memory is not dependable. But one thing is dependable. Consciousness. Whatever it is, loving, not loving, you are aware. Um, remembering and forgetting, you are aware. Understanding, not understanding, you are aware. Awareness, consciousness, the sense of my own existence is always there. And it's there effortlessly. To use memory, you need a little bit of effort. To intellect, more effort. To use emotions, all of those require effort. But your own awareness, your own existence, sense of existence, is always present, effortlessly present. Actually, none of this is very controversial. I mean, if you look, one looks within, one will always find I am there. Not only that, you don't even need to look. We are so confident of our own existence, we don't even worry about it. Let me check once in a while whether I exist or not. We don't worry. All other things one may worry about. One never checks one's own existence. So we are so confident of it. Now, the only problem is this constant, ever available, effortlessly available existence is a very limited existence. Because we mix it up with the body-mind. It is existence with body subject to birth. I am not very sure that I existed before the birth of the body. It's subject to aging. I exist, but existence is becoming more and more difficult and miserable. The body is becoming more and more difficult and miserable. And death of the body. I do exist, you are right, but I have a little doubt whether after the death of the body will I exist. You see, this sense of existence, it is not really connected to the body, but we have mixed it up. Notice one simple, subtle thing. When you check, I exist, do you first check the body? No. In your dream also, you can check whether I exist. The, the actual physical body is lying uh, asleep and you are not aware of it. Still, you will get the sense of your own existence. So that internal sense of existence doesn't depend on the body. And yet we mix it up with the qualities of the body, with the age of the body, health of the body, existence, non-existence of the body. Birth and death of the body seems to be my creation, my destruction. Then mind. Yes, I exist. I am aware. But a miserable awareness, unhappiness, depression, dissatisfaction, sense of a lack of fulfillment. So many, many problems color our existence, a certain existence, indisputable existence, effortless existence, which is, what is that? My own awareness. But that is colored and by, by lots of unpleasant things. So because of our coloring of mind-body, this uncertain, ever there, effortless existence doesn't seem to be of particularly much use. But what happens to the enlightened one? When, one, when you become enlightened in Advaitic sense, you realize the limitlessness of this certain Always there, effortless existence. Limitlessness means you realize, oh, this existence, this awareness, which I am, is not subject to birth. It's not subject to death. It is immortal. I'm ever there. I'm permanently safe. Nothing can disturb this existence. It is eternal. It is, it is infinite in time. Time means it is not born or destroyed. It is not cut off in time. It is also... Um, not one little existence among many existences. There is an ocean of existence which I am. Everything in this universe which seems to exist, exists in me. Not in this body, in the existence itself. So this realization comes. The existence, my own in little apparently individual existence and the cosmic existence of God, Krishna, Vasudeva, they become one and the same. They become one and the same. Which two become one and the same? My effortless, ever-present, indubitable existence and the cosmic existence of Krishna or Vasudeva. So then I become this indubitable, effortless, ever-present, but infinite existence. This is Advaitic realization. But then the consequence of this is that I and God are one existence and God is never separate from me. In what sense? Just as I am never separate, I am totally confident, I am always there. That level of confidence will be there with God. 
that God is always there, one with my innermost self. Imagine the tremendous closeness you feel. You are Brahman, but as Jiva also, you are always one with God. Because the same thing which is Jiva, this little being, is also Vasudeva, Krishna, Ishwara, Bhagavan. So Bhagavan and you become one. And that one cannot be separated. You have already realized it. And it's always available to you. Therefore, Krishna says, Nitya Yukta. Always connected to me. Always in tune with me. Effortlessly. Then, Nitya Yukta, um, Eka Bhakti Vishishyate. Not only that, this person, this enlightened one, the jnani, has only one pointed devotion. Because Shankaracharya explains there, Anyasya bhajanas, Bhajaniyasya Adarshanat. Because this person realizes there is nothing else to be worshipped. Nothing else to be loved. God is the only reality that is. All those hundred other things which distracted me, tempted me in this world, they don't exist. They are all appearances. Uh, what exists is this unlimited, unbroken, undivided existence consciousness, which I am, which God is. So I'm ever tuned with God and ever disconnected from this world of appearances. Eka Bhakti. I have only one pointed devotion naturally because there's nothing else to be devoted to. What will I be devoted to? What, what will I be attracted to in this world? World of mirages and appearances and ghosts and shadows. Nothing. So this Jnani, for whom this is a clear fact, an effortless fact, already accomplished, ever accomplished fact, this Jnani is the best of Bhaktas. This Jnani is the greatest of lovers of God, Krishna says. Eka Bhakti Vishishyati. This Vishishyati means excels. Priyohi Jnani no Atyattam Aham. I am most dear to the Jnani. Most dear because I am the very Atma of the Jnani, the very existence of the Jnani. One sadhu, commenting on it, put it nicely. Atyattam. He makes a play on the word Atyattam. Atyattam normally means most. Uh, you know, how is it translated in this book? Uh, atyartham means I am very dear indeed, very dear, most uh, in the sense of uh, exceeding everything else. Atyartham. But uh, this um, one commentator in Hindi, he makes this nice play on the word Atyartham. Atyartham means object, anything in the world. Atyartham means transcending all objective um, barriers. So what separates us? Body separates us. Annamaya kosha, pranamaya kosha, manomaya kosha, vijnanamaya kosha, anandamaya kosha. The physical body, subtle body, causal body, these separate each of us. Yes, we are one existence and one consciousness, but it doesn't feel like that at all because we are very aware of what separates us. We are aware of bodies and minds and personalities. It is very different from each other because our attention is there. But this jnani, atyartham, jumps over these differences. Between this Jnani and Ishwara, between this Jnani and Krishna, no Annamaya Kosha, Pranamaya Kosha, Manomaya Kosha, Vijnanamaya Kosha, Anandamaya Kosha, separate them. There is no separation of physical body, subtle body, uh, causal body. They are so close. They are one. Because they are, he is my own Atma, he says, Atyartham, most dear to me, transcending, jumping over all possible blocks or barriers. Such a Mama Priya. And he is also very dear to me. I am most dear to him because there is no boundary between his self and me. And he is also most dear to me because he is my own very self. And Shankaracharya says it is well known. The most dear thing in the world is Atma. Atma is the most dear thing in the world. Um, why? Let me give you one little uh, argument given in Panchadashi, the first chapter by Vidyaranya Swami. He says, so can you prove it? We keep saying Atma is the most dear thing in the world. He said, yes, we can prove it. How do you know what is dear and what is not dear? That which is dear to me, I seek to get it and hold on to it. What, what is dear to me? Uh, the, the one which gives me happiness, pleasure. That which gives happiness to me is dear to me. That which is dear to me, I seek to hold on to it. That which is not give, does not give me happiness is not dear to me. And if it's not dear to me, I do not seek to hold on. I can, I can seek to get rid of it. 
it could be things it could be persons it could be gadgets it could be food anything so now what what do we have if something gives me happiness it is dear to me eat it or he she place food anything is dear to me and if it is dear to me i seek to keep it now reverse it if there is something that i always seek to keep then it must be dear to me and it must be giving me happiness so what is the one thing that we always seek to keep we are never seek to get rid of it is my own self everything else i may seek to get or get rid of but the self we i never seek to get rid of i always want to preserve it i want to live immediately somebody will say what about suicide but notice even in the case of suicides it's always something external my own existence is not my problem then one would be always be suicidal all the time no suppose i have great debt i cannot pay it off and then i the great sorrow i want to kill myself or there is some um, problem in uh, relationship or health problem i cannot bear it anymore i want to kill myself but then isn't he trying to destroy the self isn't then the self not dear no such a person if you solve the problem they'll be happy to live i have a debt i cannot repay i must kill myself so don't kill yourself let let us repay your debt debt is now repaid good what about your program to kill yourself no that is cancelled now once the debt is repaid i have no more problem that means it is not a problem of the self external problems may force person to think about committing suicide but i myself am never a problem to me i in fact i am always a source of happiness to myself so atma is always dear to oneself that is the argument and shankara acharya just says because the atma is always dear to myself gyani is my atma god says the gyani is very dear to me then actually you can say nitya yukta eka bhakti vishishyate nitya yukta means one with 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 god and the term used in vedanta is pratyag abhinna chaitanya pratyag abhinna chaitanya means pratyag means inner innermost um consciousness what is our innermost experience awareness that is our innermost experience abhinna non different from that bhinna different non different from that is god what is ishvara is pratyag abhinna chaitanya is one and non different from the our innermost consciousness this our awareness therefore nitya yukta and eka bhakti visheshyate there is only one thing that the gyani will love that is god and god alone because everything else is an appearance the world is an appearance this is another way of saying uh, brahma satyam jagat mithya jiva brahma eva napar basically is another way of saying that then so the gyani is most dear to you others immediately they feel left out this is not just they feel is unfair so you don't love us if you are complaining to god the other three types of devotees do you love only the gyani the god says no 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 of course not i love everybody then uh, in number 18 that god has no favorites udara sarvai vete gyani tvatmeva me matam astita hi yuk उदारिबरलिबरलिंग being a uh, good people uh, open people uh, they are not small they are not petty they are not mean all are good all those who are devoted to god even if they are devoted for money even if they are devoted for some worldly purpose let my disease be cured but you see they have that faith in the existence of god therefore in crisis in serious problem they are going to god or in lot of desire i want i'm so greedy for money or success they're going to god often that is a sign of real belief because when they are in pressure in a corner in a tight spot whom do they turn to to god it may not be so when so many uh, so called uh, devotees who say i don't want anything in the world i want only god moment they are in a tight spot 
they catch hold of everybody except God. God. Which means, this is something that reminds me of what Ayan Maharaj was saying. That intellectual ascent kind of the belief and the real belief. The French existentialists, they got it right. They used to say that, that uh, don't listen to what a man says. Watch what he does. So in pressure, un under trouble, whom do I run to? Do I run to a powerful person? Do I run to my wealth? Do I run to my power? Or do I run to God? For worldly purposes. So they are great people. Anybody who has devotion to God is a great person. So look, look at how liberal Krishna himself is. He is not saying that, oh, you want me only for your worldly purposes. Then you are not a devotee. No. For anything that you uh, approach me and you love me for that, uh, I, 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 um, I love you and I will protect you and I will fulfill your desires also. Udara Sarvaeva. All of them are liberal. Just by the fact that they are devotees, that makes them all great people. But the Jnani, he repeats again, Jnani and I are one. Jnani to Atmaiva. And he is so hum humble here. Krishna says, Me Matam. This is just an opinion. This is what I, what I am saying. Sri, Sri Ramakrishna often used to do that. When he would give some very high teaching and others did not agree, he was giving it to maybe some close disciples. Um, then he would look at the people who did not agree and he would say, oh, that was just something between us. You take as much as you like. And I, some, it's just my opinion. Uh, Krishna is saying here, he is not giving up his point. That Jnani and I are one reality. Why? Astita sahi yuktatma mame eva anuttamam gati. This one, realizing that he is one with me, remains completely focused on me as long as he lives and will attain to me. Anuttamam gati. What is anuttamam gati? Moksha. Full realization. And liberation from samsara. The matchless goal. The final goal of spiritual life. This one will surely attain. Others. So what about others? They too will attain this, but it, it, might, take a, it might take time. This one has the desire for success. That one has the desire for, um, you know, learning or, or popularity. So God will say, good, they're devoted. I'll make sure that they get what they want in the next life. The next life, this one will become, um, you know, great success in, in life and whatever he or she does will, will be successful. That one wants to be popular. That one will have maximum number of Facebook followers like this. God will make sure that you get your popularity, your success, whatever it is. And then to higher spiritual goal, uh, God realization. So all will attain to God, but that might take a much longer time for others. This one will surely attain in this birth. There is no doubt about it. Will attain to God realization and liberation. Anuttamam gatim. What a beautiful word. Matchless, without parallel. Highest goal, anuttamam. Which nothing, that's something that cannot be exceeded. Now we come to 19th verse. So this is the verse which, which I wanted to talk about actually today. There is a line here which is one of the most important lines in the whole Bhagavad Gita. Bahunam janmanam ante jnanavan maam prapadyate vasudeva sarvam iti samahatma sadurlabha At the end of innumerable births, the man of realization takes refuge in me knowing that all this is Vasudeva. Such a, such a saint is exceedingly rare. This line, what the line I'm referring to is the second one. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. This is the highest realization. The greatest realization. This is the goal of uh, Advaita Vedanta. And this has been stated straight away here. This is the final goal to be attained at the end of many, many lives. The Lord alone is everything. Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. Brahman alone is everything. Swami Saradanandaji, once uh, Sharat, Sri Ramakrishna asked him, what do you want? Uh, others, he was giving them whatever realization they wanted, different visions, the close devotees. This was before the Kalpataru day. Um, and Sharat said that I want to see Brahman in all beings. And Sri Ramakrishna smiled and said, oh, but that's the last thing. That's the final thing, that God is everything or in all beings. Then uh, Sharat said, nevertheless, I want that only. And Sri Ramakrishna said, you will have it. And he did. Uh, later on in life, he, he admitted that he has this vision of Vasudeva Sarvamiti, that all is God or God is present everywhere. 
Now, the first line, let's put it aside quickly. It might be sound ominous. After many, many lives, you come to this realization. Jnana one, maam prapadyati. You get enlightened knowledge and realization. Many, many lives includes many, many animal births, many, many human births. After many, many lives, one gets a human birth. And the human birth, for the first time, enlightenment becomes possible. Unfortunately, we do not take advantage of it. We are still trapped by raga dvesha, pursuing uh, likes and dislikes in this world, swayed by our senses, swayed by our attachments. It's difficult. Swayed by our attachments, difficult to overcome all those. But because of that, we are still remain trapped in samsara. Usually, unless one does some very uh, heinous act, usually once one gets a human birth, one will keep getting human births. But it may take a long time before one becomes one does what is human birth meant for, for God realization. Sri Ramakrishna says in one place, is a human being a, a mere thing, a small thing? A human being can realize God. Manushki kamga ishchad darshan korte A human being is not a small thing. So this human birth, but it must be turned towards God realization. Now, what is the final state? That is what is stated here. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. Vasudeva literally means Krishna. But um, a deeper meaning, Vasu means that in which all exists. And Deva is the shining one, consciousness. So Vasu would be existence, Sat. Because everything is coming from existence, is in existence and will disappear back into uh, existence, Sat. The Sat being or existence itself manifests as all and is the source of all and then the ultimate goal also the end of everything there just like all waves come up in water and then they play around in water and they go back into water they always wear water so as the cause of all uh, vasu that, that in which everything is what is the nature of that cause deva the shining one consciousness so this is a deeper meaning of the word vasudeva Vasudeva, um, the son of Vasudeva is Krishna, of course. So that's why Vasudeva, Sarvamiti. Now, what does this mean? How is God everything? In two ways, let me talk about it. One is the Advaitic way. A simple thing we realize, all people, living sentient beings, all beings, they are living, they're living bodies. They are born, they come into existence, they grow and change and age and die. They go out of existence. They come into existence, they go out of existence. All thoughts also, thoughts, our internal life, thoughts, feelings, emotions, much faster. They're popping into existence and then going out of existence. Actions, whatever we do, worldly actions, spiritual actions, good actions, evil actions, they come into existence and they go out of existence. And places, from our house to the entire planet, all of these, they come into being, they stay for some time, then they go out of existence. One thing common to everything is existence itself, my own inner sense of being. All of these I experience, but my own inner sense of being is always constant. At no time is it possible to experience oneself as not being. The very possibility of experience is there only when you are. Your own existence is it's illogical not to exist for you, your, uh, your own inner being. This is a strange kind of logic, but it's actually true. Now, this constant inner being, um, everything appears and disappears in it. There's logic here. that if, if there is such a thing as being, existence itself, then naturally everything that exists has come from that, is in that, will disappear back into that. Because nothing can be there without existence. Anything is means it exists. So in Sat or in being, everything is there. So that if Sat alone was there before this creation came, and then Sat alone remains at the end of the creation of the universe, and the universe disappears, is destroyed, then in the middle, when we are seeing all of this, it must be that Sat alone, that being alone. What was, um, Gaudapada puts it another way, negative way. What was not there earlier, what will not be there later, is also not there right now. <laughs> what was not there earlier? Everything. 
we were not there as this uh, living li limited beings we were not there earlier before our birth we did not exist as these beings and we will not be there very soon after our own deaths we will not be there not as these beings our thoughts feelings emotions they are even more fleeting they were not there a moment ago and they will not be there we know for sure moment later at least when we fall asleep then if those were not there earlier and will not be there later and godapad is saying right now also when we are experiencing it all they don't exist but then something does exist otherwise this would be impossible there's something going on here that something is being itself sat itself that is vasudeva sarva meeting in the middle between creation and destruction whatever is there is nothing but vasudeva that sat that being this is the logic this is from the advaitic perspective from the dvaita perspective or devotional perspective there they don't argue that if it was not there before it will not be there later it's not there now so the only thing that exists is existence itself pure being pure existence no 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 there vasudeva sarvamiti has a very beautiful and sweet meaning this is a simple direct meaning is that my lord is everything to me my krishna is everything to me uh, it is my father and my mother and uh, and my relatives and my friends is my wealth my power my happiness everything is my lord everything that is i have nothing but my lord in that sense vasudeva sarvamiti in the sense in which the gopis loved krishna for for them krishna was everything um i want to uh, read out to you a song of the gopis it illustrates the devotion of the gopis from the gospel of sri ram krishna nath tumi sarvasya amar lord you are every you are everything to me or all that i have is you and a nice translation by john moffit this is in the gospel of sri rama krishna where actually the topic was the devotion or the love of the gopis for krishna and there this song ram lal who had a very good singing voice he sings this song for sri rama krishna in the gospel of sri rama krishna in this book is page 207 the date is there are many many songs in this date so many songs were sung so the date is April eight, eighteen eighty three. Eight April eight, eighteen eighty three. There, this song is sung. This song. Why am I reading it out? Because it perfectly illustrates the second meaning, the devotional meaning of Vasudeva Sarvamiti. Remember, this is in the seventh chapter. Already, the topic of devotion has started. It will not do only to give, only to give a straightforward Advaitic interpretation. Everything is Vasudeva in Advaitic sense. It's pretty easy to uh, explain. But here is a, uh, a different explanation. So here is the song the conversation page 207 the conversation turned to the spiritual zeal of devotees as illustrated in the earnestness of the gopis of vrindavan ram lal sang thou art my all in all o lord the life of my life the essence of essence in the three worlds i have none else but thee to call my own thou art my peace my joy my hope thou art my support my wealth my glory thou art my thou art my wisdom and my strength thou art my home my place of rest my dearest friend my next of kin my present and my future thou my heaven and my salvation thou art my scriptures my commandments thou art my ever gracious guru thou the spring of my boundless bliss thou art the way and thou the goal thou the adorable one o lord thou art the mother tender hearted thou the chastising father thou the creator and protector thou the helmsman who dost steer my craft across the sea of life master to the devotees ah what a wonderful what a beautiful song thou art my all in all so this is the second meaning of vasudeva sarvamiti god is my all in all and um um there is a beautiful story that swami ramsukdas ji narrates so the gopis have gone in vrindavan to draw water from a well 
and they hear these monks discussing Vedanta, Brahman, Jiva, Jagat, you know, the uh, sentient being and, and infinite consciousness and the material order of the universe. And one gopi asks the others, and the other gopi, who are this Brahman, Jiva and Jagat? Never heard of them. And the uh, other gopi says, they must be relatives of our Krishna, of our darling Krishna, because these are monks. They will not speak of anything other than Krishna, isn't it? So <laughs> they must be related to Krishna somehow. Now, this, this has a deep meaning. Whatever is experienced in the world and beyond this world also, in three worlds, the devotee will immediately relate it to, um, to God, to the beloved. They are all related to our Krishna, surely. What else is there to talk about? So, uh, Vasudeva Sarvam in that sense. See, I've, I often mentioned that in um, Vedanta, uh, in Sanatana Dharma, in Hinduism, there are two paths. Jano ya mano. Either you know it, you realize it, or you take it on faith, believe it. So, these are the two interpretations which are going on here. You can take uh, both of these. Um, one is both uh, Ram Sukhdas Ji mentions, why I'm read, uh, using Ram Sukhdas Ji's interpretation here is, in his Sadak Sanjeevani, he has written more than 30 to 40 big pages, 40 pages on this one verse. Um, so he has dwelt on it for a long time. He says there, this is apparently talking about the enlightened one, uh, whom Krishna is praising so much as the best of bhaktas, but it is actually an instruction to us, to spiritual seekers. How? There are two, two kinds of sadhakas. The one on the path of knowledge, the one on the path of devotion. The way he explains it, both seem to be uh, highly uh, on the path of knowledge, actually. You see how he explains. One is, one path is the path of uh, viveka. The other path is the path of bhava. The path of viveka is the path of not this, not this. One unchanging Unlimited awareness, I am. Everything else is an appearance, jagat, mithya. And then Ramsukdasi adds, this is especially useful if raga dvesha is still there in the mind. If the world troubles you, it's good to see it as false. It shouldn't trouble you. You see, what, what happens is, when you say, look at, see God in everybody, one question will be, that person behaves nastily with me. And this person or the world, health is not good. How can I see the divine unlimited in that nasty person or in this uh, failing body? Now the name and form are so vivid there. The personality of that nasty person is so vivid there. It obscures. It doesn't enable me to think of that person as God. What is going on? Raga Dvesha is still strong in the mind. Likes and dislikes. Conditioning is still strong in the mind. And then Ram Sukhdasji suggests if that is the case, then go straight to the highest Vedanta. Why this suggestion is quite paradoxical. Normally we think it's only in the mind which is highly purified that you can go to the highest Vedanta. Otherwise take to the path of bhakti. Here he reverses it. This is the ultimate teaching. So therefore he says here, if you are having trouble with the world, see the world is false. It's very easy to actually at least understand how the world can be false. From the perspective of pure being or pure awareness, which I am, everything is dreamlike, shadow-like, without essence. This is the path of Viveka. And you realize one Brahman alone, in that sense, everything, Vasudeva Sarvam. Sarvam is not there. All is not there. Brahman alone is there. Vasudeva alone is there. This is the sense in which Vivekananda told Mary Hale. When Mary Hale said in that poem, I have understood what you have taught. She wrote this poem to Swami Vivekananda. I have understood what you have taught. You have taught everything is God. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. You know? So everything is God. And Vivekananda replied that I have never taught such strange doctrine. He actually said that's such queer doctrine, but it's not politically correct anymore. So such strange doctrine as, I've never taught such strange doctrine as all is God. Then what have you taught? Because you, are, you always say that, that all is God. Says, I have taught that all is not, God only is. All is not, God only is. This is one path. This is one way of understanding all is God. That all is not, God only is. In the dream, whatever you see, whoever you see, and whatever happened is not. Only thing that's real there is the dreaming mind. 
That is one way. Then Ram Sukhdas Ji says, there is another way of understanding this one. The path of the, the devotee, the one who loves God. Now, this person, because of love, bhakti, the raga dveshas are purified and connected with God. He's no longer bothered by the world. So, in everything in the world, this person can imagine and come to feel the presence of God. Yes, it is imagination. Immediately, the jnani will raise the topic, will raise the objection. This is not knowing. This is believing. Yes, it's believing. But it's believing something that's true. So, it will work. You're believing something that's true. And in all people, in all activities, in all places, and in all food, in all consumption, in all suffering, you see the Lord. You don't deny the suffering or the enjoyment. You don't deny the persons or the places or the activities, things which are going on. Yes, all is there. And my Lord alone is, uh, is what is appearing as, or not even appearing. The word appearing will take, make it Advaita. Has become all this. I say, if God has become suffering, then what kind of God is it? God has not really become suffering. God remains as suffering, uh, as, uh, remains as God, and is, I'm experiencing it as suffering given by the Lord. The more important thing is, it is God. Like that Sadhu Vivekananda would mention with great approval. When the cobra came and bit it, and said, it's a messenger from the beloved. It's a messenger from the beloved. Now the cobra and the bite are terrible. But the vividity of the presence of the beloved of the Lord is so much that all these things are minor. And all the problems are minor. Even the pleasures also of the world are minor. What is one constant is the presence of God. So this is based on bhava. Now you can take up either. You can take up the path of jnana, viveka, discernment, or the path of devotion, bhava, and a spiritual a devotional spiritual attitude. Yeah, bhava is a devotional spiritual attitude. First one is jano, know it. The second one is mano, uh, believe it, uh, accept it in faith. And this faith, and Ramsuk Dasji quickly points out, a very important point. He says, this path of knowledge and this path of devotion are both knowledge. <laughs> he would, the, the objection from the Advaitin would be, yes, yes, all that's fine, but one is bhakti and one is knowledge and one is about reality and the other one is about believing stuff. Ram Sukhdasi said, no, no, no. From a spiritual perspective, what you are saying is correct from a technical philosophical perspective, but from a spiritual perspective, both of these are knowledge and anything other than this is ignorance. To see God only and not, the world does not exist, God alone exists as existence consciousness. That is knowledge and knowledge par excellence. All the world exists, but everything is pervaded by my Krishna. All is nothing but my Krishna. Yes, that is a bhava, but that's also knowledge. What is not knowledge, according to uh, Ram Sukhdasji, what is not knowledge is to see the world as we are seeing it now. There are separate, independent existence, some of which is nice and worth chasing, some of which is terrifying and, worth avo and supposed to be avoided. And God is sort of something theoretical and not cool or something like that. That, he says, is ignorance. That is real ignorance. Um, I remember Swami Vigyanananda. He goes to Sri Ramakrishna and once he asks, as a young student, Sir, have you read Kant and Hegel? And Sri Ramakrishna said, Oh my goodness, all that is ignorance. Why are you reading all that? Now, what does it mean? Unless one has actually realized God, Whatever you do, whether it is religion, science, art, is still in the realm of ignorance. In the Mundaka Upanishad, the Rishi says, Dvevidye, Veditabdye, there are two kinds of knowledge to be learned. Parajaiva Paraja, the transcendent higher and the empirical lower. And then he goes on to say, what is the lower knowledge and what is the higher knowledge? Uh, lower knowledge is everything that you can think of in those days. Tatra para rigveda yajur veda sama veda atharva veda shiksha kalpa vyakaranam niruktam chando jyotishamiti. What is the lower uh, kind of knowledge? All the Vedas, including the Upanishads, all your Vedanta, everything, and um, grammar and um, poetry and uh, uh, astrology, whatever they had knowledge in those days, whatever the syllabus was in the university in those days, all of it without 
remainder without exception is lower knowledge. Then uh, question remains, you have not left anything over. What is this higher knowledge you're talking about? Parayayata daksharam adhigamyate. The higher knowledge is that by which the, the, uh, the akshara, akshara means the, the changeless, the decayless, the absolute is realized. That means not even the texts, not even the Vedanta studies, it's the enlightenment itself, the realization that I am Brahman, that only counts as the higher knowledge. <laughs> and everything else is the lower knowledge. Some of it will take you to the higher knowledge, but it's still lower knowledge. And Shankaracharya goes further and he says about the, all the lower knowledge, he says, avidya hisa. The lower knowledge is no knowledge, it's ignorance. <laughs> You don't deny the practical utility of science and medicine and uh, you know art and culture. That's always there. But uh, as long as you don't realize God, you're still in the realm of uh, Maya, in the realm of darkness. So, um, Ram Sukhdas Ji is right. Whether in devotion or in knowledge, you, say, uh, you approach that realization, Vasudeva Sarvamiti, the Lord alone is everything. You are in the realm of knowledge. Anything else, you see things as different from God or God as non-existing or uh, then you are in the realm of ignorance. Then, this is, and the way he puts it is very close to Advaita Vedanta. In fact, even the devotional part of it. He says that the only difference between God alone is and nothing else is or God is everything is like, he says, golden ornament. You see all the ornament and the Gyani says it is gold, gold, gold. And the uh, um, devotee says, what a dry rascal. Don't you see the beautiful necklace and the beautiful uh, uh, ring and the beautiful uh, tiara and the uh, bracelet? And I know all of it is gold. The stress is, my Lord alone is all of these. These are all there. My Lord alone is all of these. And uh, for the jnani, all of these is cancelled out. Isness is there. Awareness, isness, awareness is there. Um, he puts it very well, the commentators, Ram Sukhdasji. He says, by this realization, what happens? By, he, says, he calls it Tattva Jnana, the realization of reality. By this, which what reality? Vasudeva Sarvam, Lord alone is everything. What happens? First, by the knowledge of reality, samsara has no longer any independent existence. And Brahman is realized. This is the approach of the jnani. Samsara is not, a, not an independent existence anymore. It's a manifestation of Brahman. And when you apply Tattva Jnana to Brahman, to the absolute reality, what will happen to the jnani? Absolute reality will be experienced as I am that, Aham Brahmasmi. What does it mean? What is that absolute experience, uh, absolute um, existence? It is my own existence. And what is Tattva Jnana, knowledge of reality? I begin to see my own existence as it is. It is direct experience of Brahman that I am Brahman. So this is the jnani's path. In the devotee's path, what does this tattva jnana, the experience of reality do? Again, samsara will be, it doesn't have an independent existence. All of these are there, but my Lord alone has become uh, everything. And then what about God? In and through samsara, God will be experienced. In every experience, you will feel the presence of God. So these are the two approaches. Jnani's approach, by this Vasudeva Sarvamiti, the samsara will be reduced to an appearance and Vasudeva, Brahman, will be realized as I am Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. For the devotee, by this knowledge of um, Tattva Jnana reality, Vasudeva Sarvam, samsara will be reduced not to an appearance, but let's call it the glory of God, the play of God, the leela of God, or whatever, but real. And what will happen to God? God will be now experienceable in and through every experience in samsara. In all people, in all um, actions, everything will reveal to me Vasudeva. One Shal Sadhu put it beautifully. You're searching for God. Uh, oh, Swami Ashokanandji, he said, where can I find God? Foolish question. Where can you not find God? This is the devotee's uh, realization. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. Then he says, Mahatma Sadurlabha, such an enlightened one is rare. This is the final enlightenment. Such an enlightened one. So Saradarandaji, 
he got this enlightenment, this realization. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. Such an enlightened one is rare. And then, um, as a note, Ram Sukhdasji has said, these enlightened ones, they may, these teachers, Mahatma, these Mahatma, he gives a note on the Mahatmas. These Mahatmas may come in five varieties, he says. Six, but I'm conflated into five varieties. So what are these five varieties? One, Vasudeva Sarvam, the Lord alone is everything, and this one remains immersed in that. So from our perspective, that person may remain like in Samadhi or a deeply mystical, not really interacting with the rest of us. I mean, I'm reminded of someone like Swami Brahmananda, who, was, who didn't seem to have as dynamic a life as, say, Vivekananda. And yet, why is Vivekananda saying there is a dynamo of spirituality? He said to Sharat Chandra, Swami Vivekananda, that uh, Raja, that means Swami Brahmananda, Raja has more spirituality than I have. So he called him a spiritual dynamo. Why? Because such a one is the highest of the um, Mahatmas who remains in constant communion with God. Through mystical experience, through the remaining centered in the realization, Aham Brahmasmi, in whichever way. So this, an example is Brahm, uh, Brahmananda. Um, Ramana Maharshi was something like that. He would remain in Advaitic sense, constantly inwardly focused there. The second level, a little lower, actually lower, would be the one who interacts with the world and the, through the Leela, the activities of this Mahatma, many people learn and they're inspired. They see the sadhana being performed by this Mahatma, see the uh, complete altruism and selflessness of this Mahatma. They see the complete fearlessness of this Mahatma. They really learn. Spirituality is directly transmitted by seeing and living with such a person. To the extent that little bit we have got, we have seen some such people and we have come into contact with them, it is transmitted. Spirituality can actually be like a physical thing being transmitted, like a fire lighting another fire, like a flower being given from one hand to another. It can be given. This is the second level of the Mahatma, who interact and who, who give by their life. Then um, the third level, one step lower again. So this Mahatma teaches. The second one can uh, teach also, but the teaching will be quite different. Uh, it will be maybe very simple things, a, a parable uh, or a few simple instructions, but a solid teaching. You know? um, so the Mahatma starts teaching, starts teaching Vedanta and Bhakti and so on. That's the third step, already another step lower. And Sri Ramakrishna used to use this language. I have, I have to come down several steps to say Om. The so third level, lower, the next lower level is teaching. The even lower level, the fourth one is, he says, the one does not even give teachings. The one gives do's and don'ts and gives commandments. This has to be done, agya, straight away, um, that you do this. And the fifth one, the lowest, even lower than that, the one uh, gives the Mahatma, he gives um, boons and curses. So he may help people by granting their desires or punish people or said, rectify them by cursing them. Now, these five levels, these are not levels of the Mahatma. This has to be realized. These are the, these are the levels that the Mahatmas operate on to help different levels of devotees. There are some devotees who can just by seeing and being in the presence of the completely absorbed uh, Mahatma will become highly inspired. Other devotees have to see him in action. The Another devotee with a slightly lower mind will have to be taught, actually given lessons. Uh, even lower, lessons will not work. Seeing will not work. Clearly has to be told right and wrong and threatened with, heaven, um, with hell or um, promised heaven or given commandments. Do this, I say so. Do it. It helps. The people who are clearly helped by that, that level of teaching. And finally, they're not interested in teaching. They're not going to listen to you, but they are very much eager to have their desires fulfilled and they will uh, do, go to no end to please you so that you can fulfill their desires or they're scared of punishment. Uh, so they are taught, they're brought to the spiritual life by reward and punishment, by boons and curses. Um, 
the, the five levels, they are on the model of Bhagavan, of the Lord. Saguna Brahman, Ishwara, God. God operates on these five levels. One level is the absolute reality. God remains um, uh, absorbed in uh, his, her, its glory. Second level, God comes down as avatar and does leela and we all see and learn and are inspired. Religions start on that basis. Third level, God comes as the teacher, as the guru, as someone like Acharya, like Shankara and others who actually give a body of teachings. Teachings are primary then. Then, then God also, what does God, God do? God gives commandments. Not just a body of knowledge, but actual commandments. Do this, do not do this. And finally, God famously blesses and curses, <laughs> gives boons and curses. All of these are the same God, does not degrade the quality of God. It is for the different levels of seekers. Some things work for some seekers. Okay. This is the five levels. Uh, why is, is he said here? Sama Mahatma. This is the Mahatma. Very rare indeed. Uh, Sama Mahatma Sadur Labhaha. Right. Let us now look at the comments. So the takeaway from this verse is just that phrase. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. This is the final realization. My Lord alone is everything. Krishan says, how do devotional schools interpret the word jnani in this context? As the highest bhakta? <laughs> I'll give you an example how they deal with it. The Vishishtadvaita school will say the jnani now becomes the highest bhakta. So who is the jnani? Who realizes I am not body and mind. I am a spark of consciousness. Paramatma is infinite consciousness. Jivatma is individual consciousness. I am a part of that Paramatma. Now what will be my relation to the Paramatma? To Narayan or Vishnu? It will be devotion and surrender. So that is a real jnani who will now next take the step of devotion or prapatti, uh, surrender to the supreme consciousness. That is a devotional school. Bill Nidjari says, intensity for self-knowledge can waver on the path of jnana yoga. Oh, yes, yes. Intensity can waver. Uh, but what, I'm, what it says here is the one who has realized I am Brahman already. For that person, there will be no wavering. Because just as our own um, consciousness of our own existence, it never wavers. You don't have to be a philosopher. Everybody Every sentient being, not even human being, every sentient being is aware that he, she, it exists. Unwavering. Now, if that can be connected to God, if one can see God is in, non-different from that, then your sense of God also will become non-wavering and, and, and uh, effortless. Bill, the bhakta who realizes God, isn't that person also the fourth category, the wise one referred to in 17? Um, Yes, of course. The last one. Patrick, would most Gyanis experience Nirvikalpa Samadhi? For those that don't, why wouldn't they? Most Gyanis would experience Nirvikalpa Samadhi, but some do not. Um, sometimes Sri Ramakrishna would say, or Darshan Havena, Bhav Havena, or Gyan Have. The person will not have mystical experiences, but will get enlightenment. Is it possible at all to get full enlightenment without Nirvikalpa Samadhi? Yes. Technically, yes. Um, even someone like Swami Brahmananda, we are reading, he's saying that the ways to get enlightenment, sadhanas, he says, japa and dhyana, he says, are, he says, discrimination. Uh, so clearly the Vedanta Vichara inquiry, he says, that is also, that's a path to, uh, of enlightenment. And then he says that when with samadhi, this thing becomes very clear. With discrimination, viveka, the path we talked about, with viveka, one may get a glimpse of it, he says. So, in for most cases, when the minds are not purified enough, they probably need powerful experiences like samadhi to make it clear enough. If it is clear enough to you already, then you don't need it. What, what will samadhi do? It will just confirm what you already know. Um, Or that uh, I am that, uh, what is his name? Our uh, Nisargaratta Maharaj. When one place he was asked about various kinds of samadhis and asked, that, do you have them? And he says, no. And he says, if I want, I could get them. 
and he says they are also very valuable he agrees that that if you can get them if you want and they the samadhis are very valuable but what i have already got is highest it's the final thing so i don't uh, i don't see why i have to put my mind in that particular he didn't explain so much but he just said yes one can have it yes they are valuable i don't see the need for it after uh, getting what i have got abhijit says the line from verse 7.17 ज्ञानी नित्य युक्त एक भक्ति विशिष्य रिमाइंड मी ऑफ अ लाइन फ्रॉम अभंग ऑफ संत ज्ञानेश्वर एक तत्व नाम दृढ़धरी मना वन प्रिंसिपल एज द नेम होल्ड इट स्टेड फैसली इन द हार्ट यस वेरी ब्यूटिफुली पुट Krishna Murthy Vishwanathan says is a great saying Tamil mystical poem which translates as only the ignorant thing that love and the ultimate truth are two different things yes So a traditional. Why I gave you this? Ram Sukhdas Ji is actually his school is Vishishtha Dwaita. So he will definitely in these places bring in the knowledge aspect and the devotional aspect. I have studied this from a traditional Dwaita teacher also. The same verse. That second interpretation they will not bring in. In fact, they will say it's it's wrong. What is being mentioned here is Gyani realizes Am Brahmasmi. In that sense, world is an appearance. Vasudev or God alone exists. Existence consciousness. That's what is meant. That's a little reductive. and it we is forget, forgetting that this is the bhakti section going on so there must be a bhakti interpretation for this sangeeta says why then do we commonly see this in human nature when that which was once held dear but when clearly seen it no longer gives happiness in fact pain why then does it still continue to feel dear to the mind does it if you are clear that it gives pain if you actually feel that it gives pain not just i have read about it now i understand it it gives pain um, all philosophical books have told me no inwardly if i feel it's unpleasant making my life hell it's painful and it will no longer remain dear karav says this reminded me of you talking about difference between all is god and only god is referring to one vivekananda quote objects are appearance when we see objects are appearance like movie objects on screen then we see that only awareness exists so reality is that ultimately on only krishna exists narada bhakti sutra 22 states love of gopi cannot be said to lack recognition of divine glory of krishna so can we assume that gopis had correct understanding of reality but were acting due to divine maya of krishna no not even divine maya of krishna they had correct understanding of reality and their approach was the devotional approach so that is what is a more comprehensive way if you take a classical advaita way and say well they were devoted and uh, they have to get the aham brahmasmi realization uh, otherwise they are stuck to the personal god krishna or avatar krishna but no if you see the bhagavatam it's not like that the gopis were fully uh, enlightened beings also but uh, their approach was vedanta siddhanta nrityati the conclusions of vedanta the final conclusions of vedanta it's dancing see friend it is how it dances what is dancing krishna is dancing krishna is the final conclusion of the vedanta vedanta siddhanta nityati then rama says this reminds me of you talking about two reasons why the world word mithyatvam is taught first reason for vairagya and second to see the same reality everywhere yes this is an important thing to learn one sadhu put it nicely um jagat mithyatva falsity of the world why what is the purpose of it why is it stressed one he says people think it's for vairagya dispassion so notice how ram sukhdas ji said that the first path can be taken by people who have some attraction and repulsion for the world if the world still troubles you tempts you and scares you terrorizes you then it take the path of um, vairagya jagat mithyatva world is false this is the preliminary reason as uh, rama has pointed out here this is the this is the first reason why the falsity of the world is taught in, in order to have vairagya dispassion in order to solve the problem of raga dvesha it's false so it doesn't matter it can't scare me nor can it tempt me but this is only the preliminary reason for falsity of the world the real reason why falsity of the world is helpful in our spiritual life is it points out where the reality is all right world is false then what is the reality brahman is real where is brahman all i know is the world if world is false and brahman is real then this itself must be brahman 
If the snake is false and the rope is real, where you are seeing the snake, there the rope must be. That which you think is the snake, that must be the rope. So if the reality is being pointed out, when I say rope is real, snake is false, you are seeing a snake. Now if I ask, where is the rope? You have to say there itself. I am thinking it was a snake, but it is actually the rope. Here itself, this world, this body, this mind, this experience of the world is nothing other than Brahman. Brahman plus name and form. This is the meaning of, deeper meaning of falsity of the world. Jayashri says, what does Ishta Devata mean? Um, does it mean praying only to one form, Saguna Brahman, like Krishna or Divine Mother? Yes, or Sri Rama, etc. Yes. Can Ishta Devata be more than one form of Saguna Brahman? No. It is one more than one form. You know that all forms are nothing but your Ishta. But it's a great thing to focus the mind. Each Ishta comes with a mantra, a whole, you know, there are um, Puranic stories, there are rituals, there are methods of worship, there's an iconography, there are images, there are pictures. So much is connected with each Ishta, whether it is Shiva or Kali or uh, Ganesha or the avatars, Rama or Krishna. So such vast literature is there. So many practices, so many rituals, so many songs, so many lives of saints. All of that comes with each Ishta. Those are the extras, toppings which come with the Ishta. That is enough for a person to have the Ishta and Ishta Devata and you can practice. But you know, it's also more than that because you know all the forms, all the other Ishtas uh, and the absolute reality in Guna Brahman are the same thing. I think Anuradha has raised her hand. Can you unmute yourself? Yes. No, you're still muted. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, you are you are bringing Bhagavatam into Bhagavad Gita explanation. Now, Bhagavatam is is it under Upanishad? It's not, is it? No, it's not counted as an open. I mean, it's not part of an Upanishad, part of the Vedas as such. But it's counted as an Upanishad because it is uh, so important, especially in the uh, Dvaita schools of uh, Vedanta, dualistic school, bhakti schools of Vedanta. In fact, if you see the schools <coughs> like Dvaita, Vishishta Dvaita, Dvaita Dvaita, um, and then Shuddha Dvaita, more than the Upanishads, you will see the emphasis is on Bhagavatam. Um, in fact, if you see the Iskon, Achintya Bheda Ved, yeah. the central text. They give um, uh, importance to the Upanishads, but central text is Bhagavatam. So it's regarded but as at greater the than end, Upanishad. At the end of every chapter of Gita, hmm. Bhagavad Gita, is saying Upanishadsu. Hmm. So just so, like the Gita is treated as an Upanishad, even the Gita is not an Upanishad. Remember, Gita is no, a Smriti. No, it's Smriti. Because yeah. it is part of Mahabharata. Anything other than the Shruti is Smriti in that sense. Although yeah. technically Mahabharata would be an Itihasa. But yeah. In general, it is a smriti and Gita will be a smriti. And in that sense, Bhagavatam also is smriti. But because of its great importance and the message it contains, Gita is treated as an Upanishad. Bhagavatam is treated as an Upanishad, as great as that. However, not greater. So, yes. Okay, thank you. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu